Good morning. It's great to see everybody here. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers. You too. Thank you. It's good to see you guys back. Have a great trip? Yeah. Good. No traveling problems at all? No, we had smooth travels. Good. Yeah, it was all good. Good. We can, we can tell you a little bit about it whenever you want us to. Do you want to do it online or do you want to do it afterwards? Your choice. We better wait for Gideon and Daryl. That's a good idea. Okay. We'll do it after then. Okay. Now that we have our service planned, welcome everybody online. It's great to see you. Um, if you haven't yet, Comment down below, let us know you're here. It's great to see those names. Um, if you have prayer and praise requests, you can go to info at theascentcc.com and you can send those. Those come directly to my inbox. And I would love to come alongside you and pray for things going on in your life. If you want to give as part of your worship this morning, you can go to ascentcc.com forward slash giving. And that will take you to a nice, secure website where you can give that way. Um, everybody else that's here in person, it's great to see your smiling faces on this beautiful Father's Day. Um, when you came in, you should have been given a program. Inside that program are a couple of things. Uh, first thing I want you to be aware of is this Ascent card. Um, go ahead and fill that out uh, with as much information as you feel comfortable. And on the back, there are some next steps that will go along with our message this morning and prayer and praise requests. If you have prayer and praise requests, you can write that on the back of your Ascent card or go to info at theascentcc.com. That would be great. <coughs> and if you're here and you want to give as part of your worship this morning, there is an offering envelope inside the program. You can use that envelope and inside there are multiple ways to give. Take the envelope and the ascent card and place it in the wooden box on the counter as we exit the chapel this morning. A couple of things to be aware of. We have um, the kids apologetic. Um, kid one, I think is what it's called, coming up on the 25th. Um, 24th. 24th. Next Monday. Next Monday. So if you haven't yet, sign your kids, grandkids, and yourself up to help. And uh, I assume they still need helpers. We actually are doing good on helpers. Um, we have 95 kids signed up right now. Wow. Nice. That's awesome. Nice. And, so, and we have a lot of extra help coming, so I think we're okay right now. All right. Um, but we do need help on the 25th to unload fireworks, which is in the afternoon. That's in the morning, so you go help with that in the morning, and in the afternoon you can come help unload fireworks. You see how I did that? I, uh, that was in my brain when I told them PM is a better time to unload a truck. So um, come down, help us unload the truck on the 25th, and I believe there's a sign-up sheet for helping in the firework booth. It would be great to see everybody out there signed up and helping. Um, I think it's a pretty good time. I love working in the booth and, and working with and talking to people that come up, but then again, I like to talk, I guess. So um, there is that. So that's on the 25th, and then I think shifts, shift, I can't say it, shifts, I think I missed a word in there, a letter in there, start, I believe, on the 27th, if I remember correctly, and you can talk to Jolene when she gets back on that, so... Um, with that being said, we are continuing our series on the Sermon on the Mount. Today is kind of a part two of what we talked about last week. So let me pray and we will really dig into it. Dear Jesus, I thank you for today and I thank you for this group of people that um, come to worship you and, and are serving you, Jesus. I pray that as we go through this uh, your message today that <clears throat> we can open our hearts and minds to you. We can, and our hearts are open to the Holy Spirit and what He has to tell us today. Jesus, I just pray that we can put all the distractions of the week away, uh, whether that be work or family things, um, work things, um, relationship things. Jesus, I just pray that we can put those aside 
and we can focus on what you have to tell us this morning. We love you, we praise you, in Jesus' name, amen. So, I am, I am running the computer and sound and preaching all at the same time today, so we'll see how I multitask. So, first off, I want to start with what we talked about last week. Last week, we talked about this idea our, of blessed are those who um, are poor in spirit. And we talked about what poor in spirit is. So today, we're going to talk about blessed are those who mourn. So these kind of go hand in hand a little bit. And just to remind you what we talked about last week, <coughs> poor in spirit or poverty of spirit um, the deepest form of repentance, it is a full, honest, factual, conscious, and conscientious recognition of our own moral unworth before God. So it's not this idea of being lacking in spirit or um, having a deficit of spirit like we typically think about the word poor. That's lacking money or material things. This is more of being honest and factual and understanding that we are nothing without God. We are spiritually bankrupt without God. And the idea is we come before him humbly and understand that God is God and he's the Lord of our life. All right? So... <clears throat> If you were to think about it this way, um, the poverty of spirit and knowing, understanding our unworth before God, that is kind of the intellectual side of it, the, the, the brain side of it, knowing that we are spiritually bankrupt without God. And on the flip side of that same coin, um, blessed are those who mourn is kind of the emotional, the emotional side of that same same thing. So these first two kind of go hand in hand, where the poverty of spirit is us understanding intellectually that we are nothing without God. And then when we go to this today, we're going to find out that the mourning is the emotional side of that. So the idea of mourning. <coughs> and again, when we do just like a, a surface level read on this, it, it can kind of make us think that why is it why are we blessed when we mourn how many have cried at a movie how many have have lost a, a, a beloved pet how many have lost like beloved uh, relationships those are things to mourn over right we probably cried and we don't feel very blessed in that moment, right? At least I don't. When uh, I lost my dog, Star, she was the greatest dog in the world, I mourned over her and I did not feel blessed at all, okay. right? Or when I lost my dad, I definitely didn't feel blessed because he, he was an amazing man. So blessed are those who mourn. Um, so we need to define what this mourning is. So the Webster Dictionary defines it as this. A feeling or expression of sorrow to express sadness or me melancholy. All right, so that, that's what mourning is. So how can you be blessed in that? Because we as Christians, God doesn't want us going around with our head down and and just in this kind of funk all the time, right? There is joy in Christ, and he wants us to have that joy, and he wants us to show the character of Christ to others. And when we are, if we are just in this mourning, like wearing black suits all the time or whatever, <clears throat> that really doesn't represent what Christianity is all about. So we really need to dig in and understand what Jesus is saying. All right, so the, the Greek definition here is to, get, to, to grieve or mourn, to display deep sadness, the strongest of the nine different Greek words to express sorrow. All right, so this Greek word is the strongest, the deepest sadness. All right, so we haven't quite figured out how we can be blessed 
because we have such a deep sorrow yet. All right. So we are going to talk about this description of beatitude mourning. All right. So here we are in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is sitting there and he has this crowd and they're overlooking the Sea of Galilee. And he has just said, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. And then he goes on and he's looking at the crowd and, and I don't know, maybe he sees a person in the crowd and says, blessed are those who mourn. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So I'm wondering if people <coughs> think about this idea of, oh, well, I guess I have to be in mourning all the time to enter into the kingdom of heaven. That's not the case. That's not what he's talking about. We're going to get to that. All right, so there's two types of beatitude mourning. All right, this first, this first type is a personal grief over personal sin. It's a personal grief over personal sin. All right? Um, this morning, this beatitude morning that Jesus is talking about, <clears throat> this is a morning over how we are a sinful people. We have sinful tendencies. We, we have this sin. And when we come before God, that breaks God's heart. That's why he sent Jesus to the cross, so that Jesus could cover our sin. But this personal grief over sin, we need to have this understanding. Just like those who are poor in spirit, we need to understand our spiritual bankruptcy before God. And now, on the flip side of that, we should have this deep, personal grieving over sin, our own personal sin. We should understand that sin separates us from God. Sin, um, <clears throat> when we have this personal sin and we are going off the path that God has shown us, we need to remember, we need to repent, and we need to focus back on Jesus and come back onto that path, right? But we have this deep mourning over this personal sin. And here are some biblical examples. Isaiah, he says, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. <coughs> he is mourning over him being unclean. Or in uh, uh, 64, 6, I have all, we have all become like one who is unclean and all are unclean. All our unrighteous deeds are like a polluted garment. Or if you want to say a filthy garment. All right. Paul, he says it this way. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? So this is that morning that I'm talking about. All right. This is that morning that Jesus is saying, blessed are those who mourn because they understand their sin. They understand who they are, and they understand that Jesus came to cover them. All right? And Ezra, he, Ezra prayed and made confession, weeping and casting himself down before the house of God. He understood, and he, this is the morning, he is weeping and casting himself down before God. How about Peter? Um, and Peter remembered the saying of Jesus before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and he wept bitterly. He mourned because he remembered that Jesus told him he was going to deny him. And Peter wept and mourned over that sin. Or how about David? <clears throat> Have mercy on me, O God, according to, my st to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquities and cleanse me from my sin for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean wash me and I shall be whiter than snow so David he is in mourning over his sins and his transgressions and these are biblical examples and what did they all do there's there's a, a theme that goes between in all of these examples. 
is they came before God and they confessed. They confessed, they, they weeped, they had such a deep sense of mourning because of their sin, their personal sin, that they came before God in this mourning state and they were open and, and basically they had a broken heart that God could mold and work with. So in this morning, God is molding us and helping us to become more like Jesus. Um, here are some negative examples of, uh, of what, what mourning can do. <clears throat> so I have said last week and the week before, when we look at the Beatitudes, all of this is countercultural. Like it goes against our culture and our norms that we see in our lives today. So um, a lot of times you will see people that are in sin and they laugh it off. They laugh at their own boastful arrogance and, and they are mocking God's righteousness. They, they don't care. Or uh, some re refuse to admit their sins. They deny the fact that they are spiritually bankrupt and deny their need for God. Have you seen that in our culture today? Or how about some have no sense of responsibility for their own actions. They play the victim and they blame everybody else for their sin. Have you seen that? And some face their sin, but they lead, but it leads in despair and they see no possibility for forgiveness. Or how about this? Sometimes, even as Christians, we make such so much of grace that we make light of sin. Have you ever seen that? There's a song on uh, Christian radio that was popular a few years ago. Um, and I can't think of the name of the artist. It was a gal. And she, one of the lines in the song is, I don't want to abuse your grace. This is what it means to abuse the grace of God. We think... I can do that. I know it's a sin, but I know God's going to forgive me for it. That's not how that works. All right. Um, or have you ever heard the Have you ever heard the term um, "ask for forgiveness later"? Mm -hmm. Or like you're going to do something, and I'll just ask for forgiveness later. I hate that term. I had a pastor in Idaho. He would say that to me all the time. And I'm going, if you know you're going to have to ask for forgiveness later, don't do it. So that's the idea of this. We don't want to make light of grace. Grace is an amazing thing. But when we go to abuse grace, that's a fine line. That's a really fine line to walk. I would rather... Not have to ask for forgiveness later. I would rather ask for forgiveness for things that, oh, I, I did that and I shouldn't have. I didn't mean to. Rather than, I know that God doesn't want me to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway and ask for forgiveness later. That's a real fine line, people. I found myself there before. And I had to really make some heart adjustments. And when you find yourself doing this, it's time to have that deep, deep mourning before God and have an open and honest conversation with him. Amen? So those are some negative effects of uh, this idea of sin. <clears throat> the second type, the second type of be added, holy cow, it's 20 after already. <clears throat> <laughs> the second type of beatitude mourning that we need to understand is uh, a personal grief over the sins of the world. All right? Or maybe we could narrow that down a little bit more. Over the sins of our country. Or maybe even more, over the sins of our people. Okay? So it's this deep personal grief that we have over basically our culture. We could say it that way. And here are some reasons to mourn. Some reasons to mourn this personal grief over our culture and our world. 
lack of integrity. Have we seen that in our in our culture, in our country? Lack of integrity? Or maybe a lack of, or an injustice? Or how about lack of respect for one another? I see this one getting more and more um, prevalent each and every day. This lack of respect for one another in our culture. Have you seen it? Yes. You know what I'm talking about? Yes. I can't give you an example because there are so many. Um, the cruelty against man... Cruelty of man against man. Um, how many riots have we seen? How many um, cities that go into looting over the last 15 years? Um, how about the degradation of life? Um, the idea of abortion pops up. How, how uh, normal has our culture made that? It's sad, but it's true. And we should be in this deep mourning over that. How about selfishness? Violence, rioting, looting. Romans, Paul says this. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice, and they are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliceness, they are gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, investors of evil, disobedient to their parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless, though they know God's righteous degree, decree that those who practice such things deserve to die. They not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. How much does that look like the culture that we live in today? How much does that look like our country that we live in today? The only way that we can get back to that is to put God back where we had him to begin with. Amen. Right? We need to, once we started taking God out of different pieces of our society, that's when all of this really started to unravel. So blessed are those who mourn. We need to mourn over these things, mourn over our country, mourn over our culture that says it's okay to do these things. And over our culture, not only says it's okay, but give approval to those who practice them. We need to mourn and come before God with this deep sense of mourning so that we can have our hearts broken and be molded and have God work on us and show us how to bring our country back. Biblical examples of mourning, okay? <coughs> Ezra, of this is um, examples of mourning for a, a, a land or a group of people. Ezra, he says, the people of Israel have not separated themselves from the people of the lands in their ambitions. As I heard this, I tore my garments and my cloak and pulled my hair from my head and beard and sat appalled. Now, I just want to point out, all the righteous people were bald. Just <laughs> At the evening sacrifice, I rose from my fasting with my garment and my cloak torn and fell upon my knees and spread out my hands to the Lord my God. We need to follow Ezra's example. You don't have to pull your hair out. It'll fall out by itself. I know. But we need to follow Ezra's example of falling on our knees before God with this deep mourning and laying these burdens, these, these, these cultural norms that people call them, before God. We need to pray that God will save them. We need to be in mourning before God. Another example is Daniel. Then I turned my, eye, my I, then I turned my face to the Lord God, <clears throat> seeking Him by prayer and pleas for mercy with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. I prayed and made my confession, saying, "O Lord, the great and awesome God, we have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside." from your commands and rules. 
This is Daniel, and he understands that we the, the he was praying for the people because they have turned away. How about Jesus? Jesus prays, Oh Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. See your house has left you desolate. He is praying for Jerusalem and and the people there. And then, and when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it. Jesus was in mourning. He wept over it saying, Would that you had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. How about Jeremiah? Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet. He, he wrote the book of Jeremiah, but he also wrote another book called Lamentations. Um, Jeremiah says, Let us test and examine our ways and return to the Lord. Let us lift up our hearts and our hands to God in heaven. We have transgressed and rebelled. Does that sound like our culture today? It really has. We need someone to stand up and say what Jeremiah has said, that we need to turn back to God. And in our mourning, we should be confessing and sharing with people. We need to turn back to God. We'll get to that in a minute. D.A. Carson, and you're going to hear a lot of D.A. Carson because his book is amazing. <laughs> D.A. Carson, the man who lives in the light of them, sin and death, and rightly assesses himself and his world in the light of them, cannot but mourn. He mourns for the sins and the blasphemies of a nation. He mourns for the erosion of every concept of truth. He mourns over the greed and cynicism, the lack of integrity. He mourns that there are so few mourners. Did you catch that? <clears throat> He mourns that there's so few mourners. There are so few people that understand that we need to come before God broken and mourning for our people, for our country, that he is mourning over that. Uh, Edmund Burke, the only thing necessary for triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Now, here is the promise of those who mourn. Remember, um, here in the Beatitudes, blessed are those who mourn, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Right? And Or, blessed are the poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, because they will be comforted. Comfort. Let's talk about comfort for a minute. Comfort in deliverance from sin. There's comfort in that, amen? There's comfort in Jesus dying on that cross and covering us with his blood. There's comfort in that because we can have a relationship with God because of, his, of the forgiveness that Jesus brings. Come now, let us reason together, saying, the, says the Lord, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow, through, though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. That's Isaiah. D.A. Carson. These people exchange the sackcloth of mourning for a garment of praise, the ashes of grief for the oil of gladness. So when we, blessed are those who mourn, when we mourn and we are, we are praying and we are coming before God, forgive us for our personal sin, that deep personal grief and sadness forgive us for our corporate sin i guess you could say of the country of the our people that have fallen away he comforts us comfort in helping others receive comfort there is comfort in us speaking to people about this morning. Now, <clears throat> it's important to understand the difference between mourning and this idea of reconciliation be between God and condemnation and judgment. Would you agree there's a difference in that? 
If you come before somebody with condemnation and judgment to face their, their personal sin, how much more open would they be if you came to them in this idea of mourning and reconciliation? Are they going to be more open to that? So instead of condemning and judging the world, our, our people, let's come before them with this idea of deep, deep mourning and reconciliation. Letting them know, you know what? Jesus loves you. Yeah, you might be going through a hard time now. But Jesus loves you. Think about this. How many of us in here have family that do not know Jesus? Or friends that do not know Jesus? Are they going to pay more attention if you are condemning and um, judgmental towards them? Or are they going to pay more attention to Jesus loves you? I'll be praying for you. And opening up to them about, let me tell you what Jesus has done for me. And having that mourning, that prayerful mourning over their life. Which one is going to bear more fruit? <clears throat> this is what Paul says in 2 Corinthians. Blessed be the God and our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in affliction with the comfort with, the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Um, how about in Revelation here? This is, um, we've talked about the kingdom of heaven being a, now and not yet idea. Um, we are part of the kingdom of heaven now. The kingdom of heaven is here, but yet it's not yet here fully. It won't yet be here fully until Jesus comes back and we are reunited with him in the new uh, Jerusalem, the new earth uh, with our new bodies. All right. So we have comfort in our hope for the future. This is Revelation. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and the death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning or crying nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. There is comfort in that. There is hope in the future. There is hope in our lives because we have Jesus Christ. Amen? And our hope in the future is <coughs> we will be in that not yet kingdom. Same kingdom of heaven, it's just that part isn't here yet. We have hope. We look forward to it. It's the future. Jesus coming back and us walking with God. How exciting is that going to be? Where we can walk step by step with God in that heaven. How does God comfort those who mourn? He forgives our sin. He restores our broken relationships as we participate in the ministry of reconciliation. This ministry of reconciliation. How does God comfort us, those who mourn? He can create in us and others a new heart. Remember Psalms, create in me a new heart. He offers us hope now and in the future, uh, yeah, there's the future. Psalms tw uh, 32, it says, For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away, my strength was dried up, and by the heat of the summer, as, a, as by the heat of the summer, then I acknowledged my sin to you, and you forgave me, or forgave the iniquities of my sin. If we hold that all in, we waste away. It eats at us. So what do we need? We need to mourn. We need to have this idea of mourning our own personal sins and mourning our, our corporate cultural sins. And we need to pray to God 
and lay that all at the feet of the cross. But we also need to speak. We need to speak up. And we need to let people know that Jesus loves them. We need to speak up and get God back into the places that we have taken him out of. 2 Corinthians, For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. Let me read that again. For godly grief produces repentance and leads to salvation without regret. Worldly grief produces death. That's a strong statement. These are norms in the kingdom of heaven. One side of the coin, blessed are those who are poor, blessed are the poor in spirit. And on the flip side, blessed are those who mourn because they understand that God, that Jesus is the only way. So here is um, my last statement, and I want to challenge you with. Let us mourn for the sins and blasphemies of our nation for the erosion of the very concept of truth. For greed, for cynicism, and the lack of integrity, let us mourn that there are so few mourners. So my challenge for you this week, if you look on the back of your card, is very simple. I want you to mourn this week, this beatitude mourning. I want you to come before God with this deep sense of mourning over our own personal sins, that we can repent and we can come back and focus ourselves on Jesus. I want us to mourn where we are as a culture, as a country because there are so many things that we read in God's word that are negative and we can pinpoint in our culture what those are. So my challenge for you this week is come before God with mourning and praying for our culture for our people, that they might turn and come back to God. Will you pray with me? Jesus, we come before you this morning and we want our hearts to be broken before you in a mourning state where we understand how deep sin goes and how ugly sin is. We understand that we ourselves are sinners and we need to mourn that. And we understand that our culture in many places are living in sin. And we want to lift that up to you Jesus, I just pray that you break our hearts so that you can mold it into the character of Christ. And as we, we mourn these things, they will become, our eyes will become open to them. And we will live for you. We will live in the character that you want us to have. You will overflow in our lives. And you will be the light of our world. Jesus, we love you, we praise you, in Jesus' name, amen. As we come to our time of communion today, uh, we have communion on each side of the chapel. The bread represents his body. The juice represents the blood that was shed that covers our sin and allows us to have that relationship with God. As we take communion and we reflect on our lives, I just want you to reflect on where you are in that morning. Are you mourning for 
your own personal sin? Are you mourning for um, the cultural sin of our people? And just have a conversation with God this morning. Because we remember what Jesus did on that cross. And as this next song plays, um, please make your way to the, t with, to the tables. Jesus, we come before you this morning. And we just want to remember you. We remember you on that cross. You bringing us forgiveness for our sin. You making a way for salvation. We love you, we praise you, in Jesus' name, amen.